how does physics emerge from this high order geometric structure? How do the foundations of physics emerge? Okay, right. So let's see. So there's two questions here. There's how things emerge and how we how we describe them in the first place. So so maybe let me just highlight, if I may, just the open problem that there actually is. Before we start talking about things emerging here, let's do something a little easier or a little more accessible or more believable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right? Because otherwise it sounds a bit out there. Um, let's first highlight, which is underappreciated, highly underappreciated in the in the field of physics by experts, that there's a huge gap in theoretical fundamental physics when it comes to to what I would like to call complete non perturbative theory. So the the big problem of our days in fundamental physics these days, it's in part it has actually been named the millennium problem by the Clay Math Institute, is to understand quantum field theory beyond what's called perturbation theory, to understand complete gauge field theory. So in order to know what this means, one has to know that you know, there's kind of a huge glory and misery about contemporary field theory. The glory is, and this is called perturbation theory, that when people do quantum field theory studies, when they do all these predictions for these accelerator experiments, they're using something that's called perturbation theory, which really means you approximate a very huge, complicated system, I mean, the dynamics of these fields that are spread out through space-time, by approximating stuff in infinitesimal neighborhoods. So you say, let's first take a classical field equation and just let, let's just look at tiny field variations around this classical field conversion. And then furthermore, let's suppose that our coupling constant that describes the dynamics of this field is in a tiny neighborhood of zero. And then also let's suppose that Planck's constant, which describes the quantumness of all this, is actually an infinitesimal number. So in practice, what all this means is you, deal, you're, you have a vast space. So the space of fields, which is the configuration space of your system, of field theory, is it's vast in the sense that it's not even, like if you're not on a compact space-time, which we're not, then it's not even an infinite dimensional manifold. So it's even beyond infinite dimensionality. It's a huge space. And it's, uh, it's an underappreciated, it's a public secret that for such mapping spaces, as it were, for configuration spaces or section spaces or field bundles over non-compact spaces, there is not in the literature any textbook you can find which tells you how to do differential geometry on these spaces. But that's exactly what standard physics asks you to do. You have to solve all the Lagrange equations on these spaces and form pre-quantum line bundles and do all kinds of stuff. And it just doesn't, just from the get-go, there's a showstopper, you don't even know what this math object is. Now, in the practice of physics, people go to this perturbation theory. Essentially what you do is you take a tiny, in a technical sense, infinitesimal little blob in this huge space and just do physics on there. You say, well, okay, you know, let's look at this classical solution here at zero coupling, at zero quantumness, and just see if, if I now turn on coupling slightly, what happens. This, this leads to this Feynman perturbation series. That's what these, Feynman, these famous Feynman diagrams do. And the, the, the dark truth to this is, which is not widely appreciated, I think, is this perturbation theory, it, it works wonders in some aspects. So, it, you know, there's this famous statement that Quantum field theory gives us predictions up to the 20th digit after the comma. It's the most precise theory that mankind has ever devised. That's some of these statements. This always refers to computations and quantum electrodynamics, which happens to be weakly coupled, where, where even, even though there, there's no precise proof of why this actually works, but one, one, one sees, one has a reason to not be too surprised that these things come out, right? The, because the, the big tragedy here is that the results that come out of perturbation theory, like the actual observable values, are non-converging, what's called formal power series. So they have convergence radius zero. So this is a dramatic failure, actually. It means you, you end up with a series of numbers that you can start summing up, but you're guaranteed, you know that as you keep summing up, they will, the answer will always be infinity. And there's no actual rule, there's just some dark magic, some rules of thumb, <laughs> Where to stop summing? And you see, this is really bad. So this is a, the actual output of, of current perturbation, of, of the current state of the art of physics, is this serious? And if you think about this, how, how troubling this actually is, uh, let me give you maybe to make this vivid. Let's say, I found a theory of everything. It's called the geometric series. I add up you the numbers, one over two, one over three, plus one over four, add these numbers up. This is a theory of everything. Give me any number you want to know. I can predict it, right? So you give me some number like, 
And I, I just start adding these terms until I'm getting closer to a number. And I think the larger your number is, the more precise I can approximate. I can approximate to immense precision. Still, I just have to you know, stop summing at the right point. So it's a bit of a, I just want to say, it's almost an anti-scientific um, process, right? This is, uh, this, is, this is very unsatisfactory. And that is per perturbation theory. In practice, people, is, this is exactly what they do. They have these non-converging power series. Just stop summing. And you start disagreeing with the experiment, essentially. Anyway, so the big open question of our days is to go beyond perturbation theory, to formulate a theory of, of complete physical theories uh, that are renormalized, that are globally defined outside these infinitesimal realms. Maybe non-perturbative. No? No, that are non-perturbative, yeah. Right. So that means, that means you have to in particular, now deal with this full field space. You can't take these approximations and just act like that's enough. Yeah, exactly. Right. You want to actually describe the full field theory. So for gauge field theory, you have to actually deal with this space, if you want to quantize, of all possible gauge fields on your space time and the gauge transformation. And that is not a manifold, and it's not an infinite dimension manifold, and it's not, you know, there's this group point aspect to it, so a technical for those, if there's technical listeners out there, expert listeners, so one big technical question is here, what is the non-perturbative BVBRC complex? It's, it's always discussed infinitesimal. All right, so this is where, where theory building comes in now. As I just said a few times already, but it's important to know, these spaces that appear, and you know, next there's fermions in it. These spaces, these field spaces, are then actually super spaces. So it gets far out of what is usually discussed. And... And so in order to even start discussing um, you know, the next step of 21st century physics, one needs to know in which universe of spaces, like I'm talking about abstract notions of space, are we actually working here? And so that's exactly, that's a poster child example of where category theory is useful. You have a conceptual problem, a theory building problem, right? This is not yet about solving some particular theory. This is about setting up where do physical theories live? And so that's, that's where we, what we need to do. So we need a we need a good category of generalized smooth spaces so that ordinary smooth manifolds like space times are in there. And then something like Fourche manifolds, which is a good notion of infinite dimensional manifolds, are in there. So in case we happen to be able to at least model stuff as infinite dimensional manifolds, it should still be in there. But then it should have more and everything should be compatible. And it turns out these, um, these toposes on probes of Cartesian spaces, they do exactly that. They are the answer to that question. So it's, it's interesting how it goes, right? Because in some sense... We're taking a step back. We're saying, well, actually, let's be less sophisticated. Instead of adding all these semi-norms that you need to define a Frechet space, so there's lots of analysis technology that goes into them. Let's do something more naive, but maybe more clever. We say, no, wait a second. Let's just think about it. What does smoothness mean? Well, smoothness means smoothness is, of functions is defined by recourse to what's, what stuff that happens on our ends. If you want to define what is a smooth function on manifolds, you unwind the definition and say, well, the manifold itself is covered by Cartesian spaces. Now let me restrict the function to each of these charts and then check there if it's smooth. So smoothness is something you know for maps from Rn's to Rn's. So let's take these Rn's, Cartesian spaces, with a smooth map as our probe spaces. And then let's just, let's just take the topos. Let's just declare that a generalized smooth space is, as I just described before, anything that is probable by these. So that our topos is a, what we call the topos of smooth sets. The, the topos of generalized smooth spaces probable by the smooth space. And that is a great topos. And that topos, we claim and we've shown, is a, and, and other people have worked on this, that is a great context for doing, this is a good beginning for doing geometry of physics, for actual geometry of physics. So my colleagues here, um, I mean, I, I talked a bit about this topos previously, like in my habilitation thesis. And then just recently, my colleagues here, Vigorius Geotopoulos and Hisham Satya wrote this article about smooth sets of fields, part one, where they lay out in great detail how classical field theory is done in this topos, where you do variational calculus, Euler Lagrange equations, everything a physicist would ever want to see, now happens correctly globally on this field space. This is, gives you a context of differential geometry where the operations on huge infinite dimensional field spaces, not even infinite dimensional field spaces, all exist. You can do them so things are well-defined. So this is a good platform for talking about actual non perturbative global physics because now you're in the right realm of spaces, first of all. 
you've defined the whole outer structure yes the external yeah. environment you're in the right context now for you're in the context for starting right. to talk about non paternal you're in the higher things. order geometric structure within which you can now start doing the work yeah, you have an we, idea of the space you're working in yeah we build a category of uh, convenient smooth spaces which includes manifolds and stuff in which actual field spaces actually live and showed that in their usual variational calculus that you would need for usual classical physics actually works. And then from there, one can proceed to you know, next you want to quantize and stuff, but this is the starting. That's interesting. Why didn't people take this approach first? Like, was it, let's say I'm building a building. I need to know what environment I'm going to be building it exactly. in first, right? Exactly. So why do you think when whoever was discovering physics, they decided to just work with these small local spaces without having any idea of the environment, I would, you would assume that you would have to have an understanding of the environment you're working in before you start working on the small aspects. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, of course, it's, the answer is negligence in the end, right? If people didn't <laughs> care, you know, yeah, somebody needs to come. So I should, at this point, I should maybe highlight that, I mean, this has, of course, what, I'm, what I just said, has precursors, there's people before us, of course, who did this thing. And a big name here is William Levere, who we should mention. And, we mentioned before he was the one who made this connection between Hegel and Topos theory. So this is a very interesting story. I, I do want to mention this at this point because he was, this is not even known. So William Levere these days, so he, he died a few, a couple of years ago. He, um, he was, or is a, a towering name in Topos theory. He is kind of the co-founder of modern abstract Topos theory after Grotendieck, Topos theoretic logic. But what few people know, even though he says it in various interviews, you can find it on his NLAB page, all collected, is his original motivation was exactly this. It was a physics motivation. It, he has a crazy sounding history here. He started out as a student who was assigned the task to work on some problem in continuum mechanics, so fluid dynamics, something where vector fields are important. So just, just classical stuff. But so he was a foundational thinker of the kind you just asked for. Where, where are they, really? He stepped back and said, well, wait a second, what, what is a vector field? <laughs> right, so this is the kind of question that people don't usually ask. They just take these concepts from the, given to them from the ancient ancients and they just work with them. So he stepped back and, of course, then he, he quickly left the physics department and ended the math department, but, but that was his motivation. It has been throughout his life from, from, I'm just going by the accounts he wrote himself about or gave in interviews about his own life. So he was asking, like, what is this foundational context where this physics, even continuum physics, so we're not talking about very sophisticated physics here. This is like 19th century physics, right? right. And so, okay, so on he goes and asks, so what is a vector field? And so then eventually he actually goes all the way down, like to the, this rabbit hole down. He defines abstract topos theory to come back up and define what's now called synthetic differential geometry, so define toposes. He calls them toposes of laws of notion, in which you have a, a notion of differential equations on such very generalized spaces, on, on elements of toposes, the way I just described. So, so he really was the one who, who explained first, even though this hasn't got much traction or you know, not much attention, but he actually explained that in order to have a good geometry of physics, you want to be finding your, the correct topos first. And he was focusing on this differential equation aspect, um, which is technically called synthetic differential geometry because he, that was his original motivation. Fluid dynamics or continuum physics, that is essentially a theory of differential equations. And so, so that is the, the school in which the, we, we keep developing. So, so that is a, a first answer. And then you can keep going. As I just mentioned, another very underappreciated very fundamental aspect of non perturbative physics is that that the moment that a fermion exists, as they do, like half of the world is made of fermion stuff, and like electrons, you know, they have, even though they're everywhere, they have this kind of still somewhat, um, should I say, subtle mathematical nature in that already in a classical field theory, and that is not widely appreciated, actually, even though it's so obvious, if you have a classical field theory with fermions, like the standard model, then the field spaces are not even manifolds, are not even, you know, even irrespective of the dimensionality issue, they're still not going to be manifolds because they have this odd aspect to them. The fermions are what's called odd graded functions. So they're not, so even if you have a fermion, like in a toy example in a universe, which consists of a single point, even there, if the convergence space of fermions would not be a manifold. It would be a super, what's called a super point. It would be a super space, but the fermions are odd graded things. 
So, and again, there is, of course, I mean, it's not that, of course, people deal with this like in an ad hoc manner. You run into a firm and, okay, something should enter community, you just keep proceeding. But there has been very little discussion of what it actually means now for this global space of fields that it is, first of all, not finite dimensional, not even infinite dimensional, then it's fermionic. So these are, these are exotic spaces as far as textbook stuff goes. But again, in topos theory, it's super easy now to do it because it's also, it kind of makes, um, gives, how should I say, meaning to the ad hoc physicists approach. So physicists were very successful in the past, in the past with, um, with, with pretending that a complicated problem could be reduced to looking at it on coordinate charts. By which I mean is, so you don't know what is a Fermion, mm, it's a bit hard, but, but suppose everything were happening on a coordinate chart, then just declare that the functions on this coordinate chart, you know, that some of these functions actually intercommuted with each other when you, on paper, when you, when you passed one past the other. What if you just look at the problem locally? On a chart, I know what it means for things to intercommute. So you don't have to worry about what does it mean to have an extra global space that has this, what would it mean for a global space of non-commuting functions? We don't know. But on a coordinate chart, we can say it. So they say it. But the beauty of topos theory is now it, it boosts that local picture, which is understood and under control. It gives you now the prescription for how to get the global picture. Because we just declare these local charts pictures to be our probe spaces. And then topos theory is a, is a machine that tells you, okay, then these are your generalized spaces. So we just go and take our probe spaces to now what I like to call it super Cartesian spaces, but in physics are usually just, just called super spaces. Slightly ambiguous. Because, but anyway, so just our ends again with these odd coordinates. So you can very explicitly, just by dualizing to the algebras of functions, you can very explicitly say what these things are. It's like the most simple building blocks of superspaces. And then you put a Grothendieck topology on this to say what, how do things glue. And then jup, here, topos theory gives you now this topos of super space. Now you can use these to add back everything you'd approximated earlier. Yeah, exactly. And now you know at least, you know, what the scenery is. Now, you know, if you were to now go about a non-perturbative, globally defined IH theory with fermions, at least now you know in which category to search for its field space or to operate. And so that's a huge contribution um, that the category theory does here. 